stuff that makes a stock car go is built in at the factory. Big V8 engines, 300 horsepower and more, right off the assembly line. Solid frames, good running gear, speed is easy. Too easy for some drivers and mechanics. They demand a tougher test of skill. They want speed from this. Speed from an automotive boneyard. Is there anyone with enough imagination to get 140 miles an hour from this? Imagination and a million parts no one else would want brings you here. This is the starting line for America's biggest race of modified and sportsman cars. Imagination and unbelievable hours of hard work is in every one of these cars. Where is home for these homegrown cars? Anywhere. Any crossroads gas station may hide one of these backyard bombs. It refreshes a man to quit pumping gas for an hour to tinker a little with his own private rocket sled. In an age where assembly lines stamp out new models like cookie cutters, it makes a man proud to build a special one like nothing else in this world. These are all one of a kind, hand-tooled and proud of it. Some of the parts may have been found on the scrap heap, but it's all first quality now. First quality and fast. The drivers know it. You can see it in their faces. Now it begins. 250 miles on the fastest racetrack in America. The drivers themselves predict lap speeds will reach 145 miles an hour. And they're ready to run 150 if the competition pushes them. How did they get this way? How do you build a car beyond the wildest dreams of Detroit engineers? You begin with imagination and a few solid mechanical facts. The imagination and the facts are here, in a garage that builds race cars. Not the one-of-a-kind specials, but stock passenger automobiles that are rebuilt for racing. The changes that experts like John Holman and Ralph Moody make are common to all kinds of racing, stock or modified. Some of the ideas which are now competition proved originally came from modified and sportsman cars. To understand stock car racing or modified car building, you must begin here, where parts are discarded or changed for heavy duty equipment. The wheels are first to go, replaced by oversized rims and racing tires. But a lot more than wheels becomes surplus equipment. In fact, racing cars don't need a million and one different things. What they do need is dependability. Equipment able to take the punishment of a year's driving in one afternoon. The only answer is change everything that might fail. Standard spindles are replaced by heavy duty spindles, reinforced at critical points. Wheel flanges are extra duty too. Even the lugs are longer and thicker than standard flange assemblies. The drivers don't like to carry this extra weight, but the extra safety is worth it. Front end suspension, more than strong enough for ordinary use, is replaced with export units designed for back country roads from New Zealand to the Panama jungle. Even these may be reinforced with added metal. 
wheels in every type of racing car are reinforced with an extra metal plate welded to the center. The wheels selected for racing are extra large compared to standard wheels, not as sleek and pretty, but safer at twice normal highway speeds. Even brake return springs are heat treated to ensure better performance at high temperatures. These are just a few of the things done in stock cars. Stock cars are just that. Stock chassis and stock engines without modification. Real modifications, particularly of engines, are found in the one-of-a-kind creations, the little bundles of dynamite. The chassis can be almost anything. Most mechanics like older models, which are smaller and lighter in weight. They can't be too small. The rule book insists on minimum wheelbase and tread, but the real fun begins in the engine room. This is where anything goes. Two carburetors and magneto ignition will do wonders for practically any engine. If one fuel line isn't enough, try three. If that isn't enough, try six. Add six carburetors. Now there's a system that drinks fuel and spits power. Or try a big new engine in a 20-year-old car. Amazing what an engine can do pulling half the weight it was designed to pull. And still more amazing are the results from a fuel injection system which does away with carburetors and shoots fuel and air directly to each cylinder. If that's not enough, and a supercharger, almost as good as two engines. Power, you got it. Like shooting rabbits with an elephant gun. Add a simple, reliable instrument panel so the driver won't blow the whole thing apart by being too eager. Now, you're ready to work on the body. Trim away the fenders. Add heavy-duty racing tires. The trim fenders reduce weight, make tire changing easier. The brakes need all the extra air they can get if they're to run cool. You only use a running board once when you get in. Why carry all that extra weight around the racetrack? At 150 miles an hour, air pressure builds inside the cab. So take out the windows. That breeze feels fine whistling past your ears. The same air pressure builds up under the hood. A vent will channel it out under the car. Move the engine way back to balance the weight on all four wheels. This is a pretty bumper. This is a working bumper. World of difference. On dirt tracks, you need this to keep water in by keeping rocks out. Then, polish it up. Streamline the front end. And if you still have some time, you can fool around and pretty it up. Then, get a guy with a heavy foot to drive it. Want to try building a modified or sportsman car? 2,000 hours and $5,000 will do it. If you have imagination. That's what it comes back to in the end. Imagination. And a touch of that special kind of orneriness that says, I'm going to build a race car like no other in the world. Race day. The gods and goddesses that protect Daytona Beach, Florida are out in force, dancing the sun dance. You see, it rained during the night, and more rain is predicted for later in the day. But Speedway officials hope to run the 250-mile event before a downpour. stiff wind blowing, 
which may add to the hazard of high speed. The threat of a soaking kept many fans away. Only 25,000 braved the elements to watch the running. The sun dance ended. The marching bands clear the track and they're ready to roll. Sixty-eight cars leap the pit and move smoothly into the first turn behind the pace car. Bill France, president of NASCAR, the National Association for Stock Cars, leads them around. On the pole position, inside front row, Carl Burris, car number 20. Banju Matthews, Fireball Roberts, and Marion Farr complete the first two rows. When the pace car dives into the pit road on the next go-round, the green flag will turn them loose. Moving smartly out of the long first and second turn, they reached the back stretch of the two and a half mile speedway completed only one year ago. They're moving faster now, riding higher on the 31 degree bank turn, designed for speeds of 200 miles an hour. The pace cars off the track, here they come. They're racing! Andrew Matthews grabs the lead. Fireball Roberts right behind him as they climb the bank into the first turn. <laughs> Roaring down the back stretch, 68 cars play follow the leader at 150 miles an hour. of lap one. The leaders at record speed, but the rest of the field is in trouble back in the fourth turn. <laughs> the most fantastic pileup in auto racing history takes 37 cars out of the race. Some drivers free themselves from the wrecked cars to find out, is anyone hurt? There's a serious threat of fire. Fuel tanks were split by the impact. All drivers accounted for, only eight of the 37 drivers suffered even minor cuts and bruises. And perhaps most amazing of all, no fire. Roll bars, crash helmets, seat belts, and lady luck saved lives this afternoon. 24 of the 37 cars are wrecked. 12 are totally demolished. The others are moved to their pits for quick repair, if possible. The mechanics work frantically. The race is stopped. All cars that are still running are in position on the front stretch. Months of work and planning, gone. Banju Matthews, car number 49, ready to lead them out when the signal is given. He was in position one when the red flag halted the race. In half an hour, mechanics in the pit areas try to work wonders. Time runs.
comes out on some, when after a 40-minute delay, the track is clear and the race is restarted. Of the original field of 68 cars, only 44 are in running shape, and some of these are still in the pits. The pace car leads them around in a single-file parade lap. The 40-minute delay may have serious consequences. Rain clouds are darkening the sky. Unlike European road racing, these cars and drivers are not able to go full speed on a wet surface. For some, the race is just beginning. For some, it's all over. Out of the fourth turn, the pace car races into the pits, and this is it. Banjo Matthews trumps the throttle and starts to run. Fireball Roberts and supercharged number 22 right behind Matthews as they reach full speed, heading down the backstretch. Fireball Roberts, but both drivers are overtaking slower cars. Marion Farr in number 81 holding third. Banjo Matthews gives up the lead and comes into the pits. Nothing but trouble will bring Banjo in after those sensational early laps. Matthews was clocked at 148 miles an hour on his last complete circuit. Trouble in the engine room. Matthews loses precious time as the race goes sailing by. Fireball Roberts, number 22, takes the lead. Matthews is through. His crew rolls a car off the pit apron. When a car blows up while leading the race, the drivers hide their disappointment by saying, strong, but not long. Fireball Roberts cutting a wide path through the field. Ray Fox, his mechanic, takes the place of a speedometer. The drivers go fast as they can within the limits of the car and the track. They leave the stopwatch work to the pit crew. Uh-oh, there's the rain. With 200 miles still to run. In seconds, the track is slick as grease. The yellow flag throttles the drivers from 140 miles an hour to 60. No driver may improve his position while the yellow flag keeps him at reduced speed. the wasted miles. Miles run at 60 when the cars are ready for 140. Plans, strategy, hopes, and dreams are washed away. An hour of running in the downpour wipes away all hope of new speed records. But every cloud has a silver line. Some cars, damaged in the first lap pileup, are ready to race again. Prize money depends on finishing position. These fellows are running not in the hope of winning, but in the hope of earning enough to build themselves a new car for next year. Still running under the caution signal, Fireball Roberts roars into the pits to refuel. If his crew is quick, he'll get back into the race without losing a full lap. The rain ends, but the yellow flag holds them until the track is dry and tires can get a better bike. Roberts is refueled and on his way in less than half a minute. He joins the slow parade, ready to race. There's the green flag, and the race is on. 
Number 20, Carl Burris, puts his foot down and begins to run. Burris is from Leakesville, North Carolina. He should feel right at home running here. Fireball Roberts roars up to second place. Marion Parr in 81, holding a strong third. driving a 1954 Ford with a new Thunderbird engine, is tearing along at a 144-mile-an-hour clip. But that isn't fast enough. Roberts in 22 and Farr in 81 are closing in. There goes Fireball. Roberts is passing, taking back first place. Right behind him, Farr in 81 is now second. Both cars hurtling through the corners at 145 miles an hour. Mile after mile, Roberts in 22 and Farr in 81 strain their machines, running closer and closer together. 50 miles to go, and neither car able to run away from the other. The last 50 miles is the glory road, leading to the checkered flag. Sensing the tremendous battle for first place, slower cars keep out of the high-flying groove used by the leader. Suddenly, the rhythm is broken. Number 22 has not roared past the pits on schedule. Number 81 streaks by in first place. And there's Roberts on the third turn, half a mile back. Tiny Lund, giving up precious seconds in his own race, is pushing him to the pit area. Barr's pit crew is in sight of victory as number 81 nails down first position. Roberts ran into trouble only 15 miles from victory. Marion Farr, driving a 1956 Ford, equipped with a Lincoln engine, topped with six carburetors, has the number one position all to himself. With power to spare, Farr is turning laps faster than any car on the racetrack, and his pit crew warn him to use your head and take it easy. Farr backs off and comes around for the white flag, signaling he's on his last lap. In second position, number 20, Carl Burr. Farr roars into the fourth and last turn and begins mile number 250. There's a checkered flag at the end of that long mile, and Farr takes it. One safety lap to cool the engine, then past the silent witness of that incredible first lap tangle before he wheels to the winner's circle. Marion Farr, a 38-year-old lunchroom operator, has been racing motorcycles and modified cars for eight years. This is Farr's biggest win yet. He takes the lion's share of a $26,000 purse. Of the starting field of 68, only 26 were running at the finish. 31 never completed the first lap. Caught in the biggest pileup in modern racing history. Wrecks, rain, and hard running. That's the story of the 250 mile modified and sportsman race. It has been a long, rocky road to glory with Marion Farr first over the distance on Daytona's International Speedway, the fastest racetrack in America.